Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, today's topic in Orthopedic Grand Rounds is knee dislocations. It's a very serious topic. As a resident in Dallas, Texas, I uh, took care of a patient who not just lost his uh, limb, but his life also. And uh, we really did everything, I thought, pretty well by the textbook. Uh, I'm very proud to say that since 1990 at Harvard, we've had a very uh, proud uh, track record, probably one of the largest series of uh, treatment of these injuries. And today's group of lectures is going to show the very extensive and um, outstanding experience with knee dislocations. But uh, everything has to go right. And again, this is a very good example of how healthcare in a modern trauma environment requires multiple disciplines to work seamlessly side by side. So today's group of lectures is going to be started by Nell Sampatikos, a fourth year resident, uh, and he uh, has a special interest in sports medicine. He's going to be followed by Dr. Ben Starnes, who's the chief of vascular surgery and uh, an associate professor of our Department of General Surgery. And he'll be followed uh, then in terms of orthopedic reconstructions by Dr. Chris Wall, recently appointed to associate professor rank. Uh, we're very proud of that in the Department of Orthopedic Surgery and Sports Medicine. So Nels is going to lead it off. So take the stage, please, Nels, and uh, tell us about knee dislocations. All right. Well, thank you, Dr. Chapman. Uh, again, we're talking about knee injuries and concomitant vascular trauma today. Um, in terms of our outline, I'll begin with a case presentation. Dr. Starnes will then present his own case presentation and share his personal experience with popliteal artery trauma uh, from the war in Kosovo. And uh, Dr. Christopher Wall will finish up with orthopedic insights and avoiding complications. So for our first case, this is a previously healthy 18-year-old female Division III soccer player. Uh, was playing soccer and sustained this hyperextension uh, injury to her planted leg. These are actual photos of her playing soccer. Uh, so at the time of injury on the field, she uh, complained of lateral calf pain, as well as some distal knee and anterior uh, leg tingling that radiated onto the dorsum of her foot. She was evaluated on the field by trainers at that time. They documented a good dorsal pulse. And at that point, they, they actually suspected a PCL and posterior lateral corner injury. Uh, her initial treatment consisted of a, a brace and some anti-inflammatories. They made an appointment for her to get an MRI and to see her team physician the following day. So the MRI report showed tears of her PCL, MCL, and posterior lateral corner. She had a capsular revulsion. She tore a medial meniscus. And she sustained a marginal fracture of her lateral tibial plateau. Uh, in evaluation by the team physician the following day, uh, he documented a perineal neuropraxia, again, a 2-plus dorsal pedal pulse. But no further imaging studies were obtained. So in terms of her treatment, uh, he elected to take her to the operating room one week after her injury for open reduction internal fixation of her tibial plateau fracture. Uh, a tourniquet was used during the case, and at the end of it, this was deflated, and she was found to have a cool and pulseless foot. So an emergent vascular consult was obtained. They did intraoperative angiography that showed a complete popliteal artery occlusion. She had an immediate bypass graft as well as a four-compartment fasciotomy. And interestingly, the pathology that was sent on the resected segment of uh, artery did show a large intimal tear with intraluminal thrombus, and this was felt to be present since the time of uh, her injury. So six hours postoperatively, unfortunately, her graft failed. She returned to the operating room for a revision. And eight months later, this is how she presented to the University of Washington system. She was unable to walk. She had a 55-degree knee flexion contracture. She was unable to heal fasciotomy incisions that had become infected and required multiple INDs. And ultimately, she did develop skin necrosis over her knee, posterior ankle, and toes. These are actual photographs of her uh, extremity there. So in terms of her definitive treatment, this is a young, active soccer player um, who, because of an unrecognized injury, had an above-knee amputation. And so uh, she had a, an above-knee amputation because of a delay in diagnosis. And I think this fairly well illustrates the lack of understanding of her injury, uh, the appropriate uh, imaging studies that were not obtained, and uh, uh, the treatment protocols that weren't followed. I think this is really why we're here today talking about this. So these are actual current photographs of her. She's now happily married. She's snowboarding here with a prosthesis and playing in her band. So how do we get a vascular injury in knee trauma? Well, it really begins with normal anatomy. The popliteal artery is essentially tethered between two fixed points, proximally at the adductor hiatus and distally at this soleus arch here. Uh, we see this clinically in terms of fractures, dislocations, and direct arterial trauma, whether that's sharp or blunt. 
resulting in complete disruption or transection, uh, occlusive thrombus or intimal tears. Uh, so looking for a moment at tibial plateau fractures, the Schatzker 4 and Schatzker 6 fractures seem to be most commonly associated with vascular injury. Um, Schatzker 4 fractures being uh, fractures isolated to the medial tibial plateau and uh, Schatzker 6 fractures uh, uh, involving metaphyseal diaphyseal dissociation. So this is a Schatzker 4 injury and we can see here the medial tibial uh, plateau fragment remains reduced to the femur uh, by the MCL as well as the cruciates, uh, and this allows the tibial shaft to translate anteriorly, putting tension uh, or essentially tethering the popliteal artery behind it. In the Schatzker 6 fracture, again, we see this dissociation of the metaphysis from the diaphysis, resulting in the same kind of a tethering effect. Distal femoral fractures or femur fractures, uh, the femoral artery is in close proximity um, to the posterior medial condyles, is just distal to where the the neurovascular bundle courses through the adductor hiatus. So as these fractures displace, uh, really just due to the local anatomy, they, they put the artery at risk there. And that's all I have. Thank you very much. That'll bring up Dr. Starnes. Thank you. Well, it, it really is an honor to be here uh, speaking in front of our orthopedic colleagues and several of you in the crowd. Uh, Nell's touched on a lot of important aspects of management of vascular injury, and, and uh, I wanted to bring to you some of my experiences. Um, I uh, was in the military in the U.S. Army for uh, 15 years before coming to the uh, University of Washington, and um, my first of three combat tours was to Kosovo uh, during the war in Kosovo in 1999, and uh, I had a unique uh, presentation of a patient with a significant knee injury that I wanted to share with you and share with you some of the uh, things I did right and some of the things I did wrong uh, in this particular case. So in 1999, many of you know that we were involved in a war in Kosovo. Um, we were deployed, I was with the 212th uh, Mobile Army Surgical Hospital, the last MASH in the U.S. Army, and uh, we were stationed in Tirana, Albania. Uh, very remote location, 36-bed uh, hospital, um, five-tenths, one operating theater. Uh, the Kosovo Liberation Army was being supported by uh, the United States and by uh, British SAS officers who were supplying weapons to the KLA. And there was a, a group of British SAS officers who had uh, just landed in a primitive runway. They were headed down uh, to take off in a uh, British transport plane when they, the plane that they were in ran off the runway and ran into a house and uh, there was a, a large plane accident on takeoff. A jeep that was strapped to the cargo deck inside the plane came off of its axles and uh, hit this patient in the side of his leg and he presented with a cold and pulseless extremity. Uh, this is a, an actual photo of his injury. He had uh, several injuries uh, to his right leg. He had an open comminuted proximal tibial fracture, an open comminuted lateral femoral condylar fracture, a proximal fibular shaft fracture, a transected perineal nerve with an open lateral knee, an open knee joint, injury to the popliteal artery at the level of the tibial plateau, and a posterior knee dislocation. So you can imagine that with this presentation, in this austere setting that this would have been a very difficult patient to manage. Um, this is actually the arteriogram that we obtained intraoperatively, which is a very primitive one-shot arteriogram with a single x-ray. And you can see, if you look very closely, you can see the popliteal artery uh, coming down here and a sharp, abrupt cutoff, very classic, with reconstitution of the tibioperineal trunk distally. Uh, the ideal approach to this injury uh, would be from either a medial or a posterior approach for us to repair this uh, vascular injury. However, the patient had a, uh, an open lateral knee joint and f uh, we chose to expose this from a lateral approach. Uh, we did a popliteal artery resection and a reversed interposition vein graft. And unfortunately, as we were sewing the graft in, we had an intraoperative power failure. <laughs> I don't know if anybody's ever experienced that before, but when all the lights go out in the operating room, you, 
you have to ask yourself, well, what do you do? And the answer was, does anybody have a flashlight? So uh, with the use of some adjunctive lighting, uh, we went ahead and, and repaired the artery, did a distal thrombectomy, and uh, a four-compartment fasciotomy while we were waiting for the return of power. Uh, we also, because of the distal thrombosis, gave some streptokinase or lytic therapy to try and uh, uh, regain some of the, the outflow that we had lost. Um, the patient had a palpable DP and PT pulse at the end of the procedure. We then performed debridement and lavage of the wound and an external fixator to the leg. Uh, this patient had strong pulses 12 hours later and uh, when I contacted his surgeon, we evacuated him back to Birmingham, England. Um, three months later, I had contacted him and he had uh, salvaged, his limb was salvaged and he was undergoing rehabilitation. Well, interestingly enough, I published this case report in the Journal of Trauma and about a year later, I got uh, a letter from his orthopedic surgeon in Birmingham, England. And this is that patient's leg. He had undergone, because of his transected perineal nerve, he had undergone a, mu a muscle transfer procedure and was back to running uh, and was actually planning on running a marathon. These are pictures of his leg and the mistake that you see here uh, is the fasciotomy incision. That is not an adequate fasciotomy incision. That incision should be much uh, longer, at least 20 centimeters in length. We have had quite a bit of experience in the military in treating blunt popliteal arterial injury and have published uh, extensively on this. Um, and I call your attention to this article that was written by Chris Wall uh, with his experience at Harborview Medical Center with a practi practical approach to management of knee dislocations. And I'm going to touch upon that algorithm. And the most important thing that you can remember in the room is the, di the differentiation between hard signs and soft signs. Um, there really is, if the patient has hard signs, there's no need for an arteriogram or for a CTA. All of this can be sorted out in the operating room with your vascular surgical colleagues. We can do arteriograms in the operating room and make decisions in the operating room. What are hard signs? Hard signs are pulsatile bleeding. That's a no-brainer. If you see blood pulsing out of the wound, that's, in, that's a uh, reason to go directly to the operating room. If you see an expanding hematoma, if you can feel a palpable thrill or a vibration over the wound itself, that is a sign of a significant vascular injury. If you listen with your stethoscope over the skin of the, uh, the region of the injury and hear an audible brewery, that is a, a hard sign for vascular injury. And then the evidence of regional ischemia, as Nels <laughs> touched upon, uh, we don't look for these signs necessarily because they are late signs, but pallor, paresthesia, paralysis, pain, pulselessness, and pochylothermia, which is a uh, uh, low temperature. Soft signs are suggestive of vascular injury, but not definitively associated with vascular injury. And those include a history of moderate hemorrhage at the scene, uh, an injury that would suggest a vascular injury, such as a fracture, dislocation, or a penetrating wound in the vicinity of the uh, blood vessel, diminished but palpable pedal pulses, or a peripheral nerve deficit or uh, sensory loss. So these are all soft signs. In the operating room, uh, it is important that uh, the surgeons in the operating room discuss the positioning with all involved team members because it may be that the patient's best approach is a posterior approach, not a, an approach with the patient supine. And we've found this on several occasions. The steps to uh, identifying and repairing a vascular injury involve the performance of a good arteriogram. We do that now with portable imaging in the operating theater, uh, very simple to do. Vascular exploration of the blood vessel and then temporary intraluminal shunting. That's our preferred technique. We like to reestablish blood flow to the extremity as quickly as possible with a shunt. Then while we're harvesting a vein for an interposition graft, we can allow our orthopedic surgery colleagues to come in and perform definitive skeletal fixation, usually uh, external fixation, and then proceed on with uh, vascular repair at the end of the procedure. Um, the other uh, nice thing about that is that once we've revascularized the leg, a compartment syndrome won't usually develop until you've revascularized that ischemic tissue 
and you can assess the uh, patient after they've been reperfused for a period of time to see if uh, that is someone who would benefit from fasciotomy. If you think about doing a fasciotomy, just do it. That's the lesson learned. Temporary intraluminal shunts decrease ischemic time. They allow time for har uh, harvesting of vein conduit from the contralateral extremity. We always take uh, our vein from the uninvolved extremity uh, uh, for various reasons. We allow the orthopedic team to stabilize and lengthen the extremity. Our vascular techniques involve either a primary repair, that's uh, resection of a portion of the popliteal artery, and then primary repair, end-to-end -end anastomosis. That's usually in patients that have less than two centimeters of involved uh, uh, arterial injury. A patch angioplasty, much less utilized, and most commonly utilized in a reversed interposition saphenous vein graft for the popliteal artery. Of course, we should never let the patient uh, die because of heroic attempts at limb salvage, and sometimes amputation is the only thing that we can do. Well, I wanted to uh, present to you three uh, representative controversies in limb salvage, and these controversies are, number one, all patients with suspected posterior knee dislocation need an arteriogram. Is that true or false? Number two, pulse exam alone is adequate for evaluating patients with posterior knee dislocation. And number three, prophylactic fasciotomy should be done if the patient has had greater than six hours of quote unquote ischemia. Well, let's address the first one. All patients with suspected posterior knee dislocation need an arteriogram. Well, I call your attention to this uh, article. This is uh, from the uh, vascular trauma textbook written by Rich Maddox and Hirschberg. Uh, and this is a, a compilation of published cases, uh, 264 published cases from six studies where the pa these studies had at least one year of 100% uh, uh, follow-up. So these, every one of these patients had clinical outcomes correlated with clinical findings. And in this study of 264 patients, you see here that uh, we have uh, the patients divided into hard signs present versus hard signs absent. So in the patients where the hard signs were absent, 77% of those patients had absent hard signs, and there was not a single patient who had a popliteal arterial injury that required surgery. Not a single patient. So this confirms the reliability of physical exam in excluding a vascular injury. I'm going to say that again. This confirms the reliability of a physical exam in excluding a vascular injury. When you look at the patients that came in with hard signs present, 23% of the patients had, or a quarter of the patients had hard signs, um, but 70%, so not all of those patients required a surgical revascularization, but 70% did. 30% had a false positive finding or presentation. The second controversy, pulse exam alone is adequate for evaluating posterior knee dislocation. And I would say everyone in this room knows that that's not, not true. And you can look no further than several case reports in the literature that show normal pedal pulses in the, with the, uh, in the setting of a patient who comes in with a significant vascular injury. When we go back and look at the uh, case series from before, we see that in those patients that presented with hard signs present, 70%, uh, there were 30% of those patients that had a false positive result. So that 30% is uh, the percent of patients that, uh, were, that were thought to have hard signs present but wound up not getting uh, a vascular reconstruction. As Nels mentioned, we perform arterial brachial indices. It's important to know how to do this. It is the highest brachial pressure divided uh, into the uh, ankle pressure determined at the level of the ankle. Number three is prophylactic fasciotomy should be done if there's greater than six hours of ischemia. This study was done by Fred Weaver down at USC where they looked at 100 consecutive patients presenting with blunt popliteal arterial trauma and uh, looked at the uh, rates of associated amputation. And what you see in the center two columns there are the, uh, the, the, the word present means that the patient had an amputation and the, uh, 
absent is the patient did not have an amputation. And what you see here is that preoperative delay of greater than six hours or preoperative delay of greater than 12 hours uh, was not significantly associated with uh, the need for amputation. That may be surprising to some people in this room. Also, fasciotomy, delayed fasciotomy, or preoperative compartment syndrome uh, were not significantly associated with the need for amputation. This is a small series, but it's 100 consecutive patients with follow-up. What they did find in this study was that uh, what, what was significantly associated with amputation was the presence of severe soft tissue injury, deep soft tissue infection, and preoperative ischemia. Also, if the patient had systemic anticoagulation, had a primary arterial repair, and had palpable pedal pulses within 24 hours, that patient was less likely to undergo an amputation. So I would say that uh, with regard to these three controversies, uh, do all patients with suspected posterior knee dislocation need an arteriogram? Not always. Uh, and we know that from our uh, pulse exam literature. Pulse exam alone is adequate for evaluating posterior knee dislocation. That is not true. Uh, we have to do 24-hour serial exams, and we have to examine these patients uh, uh, continuously throughout their hospitalization. As Nell said, they need to be admitted for serial exams. ABIs are important in uh, discriminating uh, which patients need further studies. And then which study to choose is uh, dependent on uh, surgeon preference. If you choose to use duplex ultrasonography, use that study and stick with it and use it as a follow-up exam. If you choose to use CTA or direct catheter-based angiography, uh, then, then uh, that is the uh, modality that should be used in subsequent studies. And then finally, prophylactic fasciotomy should be done if greater than six hours of ischemia, not always. We know that there is sometimes good collateral circulation and, and that these limbs are viable, and uh, uh, prophylactic fasciotomy is not always necessarily needed. So with that, I'm going to turn the podium over to Chris Wall. Thank you. Thanks, um, so Thank I'm going to discuss a little bit of some of the uh, orthopedic considerations that uh, go along with uh, these injuries. And uh, uh, I'd like to thank, uh, in particular, uh, Nels and Andrew Merritt, Dr. Dunbar, and all my uh, Harborview colleagues uh, who uh, have taught me a lot about this and helped us take a look at a lot of these results. I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about specifically how we go about fixing ligaments. That in and of itself would be a, a different Grand Rounds presentation. But I'm really going to talk more to how we can sort of avoid some of the simple pitfalls that lead to disastrous uh, complications. I'm a big fan of these demotivational posters. Uh, this one says, mistakes. It could be that the purpose of your life is only to serve as a warning to others. And, <laughs> and sometimes I feel this way about these injuries. I, I think that the uh, uh, multi-ligament knee injury or knee dislocation injuries are incredibly humbling. Um, when things go well, oftentimes it's because uh, they've gone well because we're a little bit lucky. And when things go poorly, uh, it can either be because we're a little bit unlucky, and sometimes it can be because we've just been plain stupid. If you look, uh, again, uh, uh, the young gal, Gretel, uh, on the left side of the screen uh, and compare her to the person on the right, there's a, a lot that's different between these two people. Uh, as, as Nels discussed, uh, the person on the left Many, many mistakes were made all along the line, and it was a failure of the medical system on every front, from her initial diagnosis and management, although everyone was well-intentioned, uh, through uh, to her definitive uh, uh, treatment. Uh, the problem was that we were just not working together as a team. The person on the right, uh, again, maybe because we're a little lucky, maybe because we got it right, is, is an example of our system working perfectly. At a, a tertiary care center, someone who has seen evacuated appropriately, treated urgently appropriately, uh, and then uh, got the definitive treatment and reconstructions and sends a picture of himself skiing in Alaska a year after the injury. Now, this isn't always the case after the injuries of this magnitude, but it is a sign that if we do things right, particularly at the early onset, it makes a big difference. This is Willis McGahee, and this is a classic uh, injury that a lot of people have seen that I think is very informative about uh, these types of injuries and, and what happens. And there's a lot about this slide that involves the take-home messages that we'll talk about today. I'm going to show it again. So one other thing I want to sort of discuss here, he's dislocated here, 
But watch what happens as soon as he hits the ground, his knee is now located again. If you weren't watching this and he just came off the field hurting, you might assume with the spontaneous reduction of the knee that everything was fine with Willis McGahee. And this is one of the, the classic things we'll talk about. We took a look at uh, uh, our series of knee dislocations that we've treated since I've been treating these uh, at, at Harborview and, and with my Harborview colleagues. And what we find that's interesting, uh, as uh, Nels touched on, is that a significant portion of these injuries are occurring because of athletics. Um, of course, we always think about the motorcycle crashes and motor vehicle collisions, pedestrian struck, and, and high energy mechanisms being responsible for these. They are a high energy, by definition, usually mechanism. But we do see these injuries in athletics now, and more and more as the, the pace, tempo, and training and uh, energy of our athletic participation goes up. The most significant sports that have been associated with these things in our experience have been skiing, football, and soccer, pretty much with equal uh, numbers. The mistake here is that you can't assume that a low velocity or low energy injury isn't a risk for a knee dislocation or a vascular injury. In fact, one of the highest risk groups for obtaining these injuries are what we call the ultra low velocity mechanism, and these are morbidly obese people. Morbidly obese people, unfortunately, can sustain this type of injury even getting up to use the commode or get out of bed or with a simple twist or fall, and this just has to do probably with the amount of energy that's imparted to the knee joint uh, in this situation. So we can't think about mechanism alone as being a uh, telling for whether or not these injuries uh, exist. Let's take a few minutes and talk about the exam. Um, this is a, sort of a classic exam that uh, lets us know that this person's had obviously a severe ligamentous injury. The, the uh, left knee in this person is behaving uh, completely abnormally. This is something we call the recurvatum varus test. It's as simple as lifting up on the great toe and seeing how the knee behaves. The knee's falling into hyperextension and varus, and it's a sign that this person obviously has a significant multiple ligament instability in this knee. The problem is that the exam isn't always quite this obvious. The person here you see on the left, and this is on the right side after the reconstructions, this is also a positive recurvatum varus test. But the person's limb is a little bit smaller. There's not quite the same amount of force when, the, when you're doing the recurvatum varus test. And if you're not careful to look carefully at both extremities when you're seeing somebody who's, who's got a reduced knee who's presenting in the emergency room, you might be inclined just to think that nothing's going on here uh, with the exam. In general, uh, the best cue I can give you about uh, uh, an exam issue is that if someone has gross sagittal plane instability, that is front back instability of the knee like you're seeing here, combined with gross coronal plane instability like you see with the back and forth maneuvers, that is oftentimes a sign that uh, the person has at least had significant multiple ligament injury. It doesn't say they've got a vascular injury, but it says that they're at risk for having a vascular injury. A lot of people say, well, what about two ligament tears? I mean, you hear all the time about people who've had, you know, ACL, PCL, or MCL, ACL, or two ligament injuries. Well, in our experience, a large number of the two ligament injuries are associated with vascular injuries. The only injury pattern that we have not yet seen a vascular injury associated with is the ACL, MCL injury. But there's still time. We haven't finished here. So it's possible that by the time we finish treating these, we are going to see somebody who's had uh, ACL, MCL that's associated with a vascular injury. It just has to do with the amount of gross displacement that can occur. We'll talk a little bit about the neurologic exam and the common perineal nerve in, in particular. In our series so far, at least looking at uh, about the uh, 100 of the acutely, producing, uh, acutely uh, presenting injuries, we had a 13% uh, incidence of arterial injury, which kind of sits in the middle or, uh, of what a lot of the published reports say about the, uh, the risk of arterial injury with a knee dislocation is. We had a 23% or a quarter of these patients have a common perineal palsy when they present. Perineal palsy presents with numbness over the dorsum of the foot, an inability to lift the ankle or the great toe towards the head. What's interesting is that over a third of people who had a common perineal palsy have an associated arterial injury. Okay. And that over half of the people who had arterial injuries, uh, that arterial injury was associated with a common perineal palsy. And so I think the take home message here is that if you examine a patient and they can't lift the foot toward their head or they can't lift their great toe toward the head, that is a predictor that you have got to rule out a vascular injury. Because just that finding alone is going to tell you that they've got, by our, find, by our numbers, about a 33% chance of having a vascular injury. It may or may not need to be reconstructed. And there's a difference between a, a vascular injury that needs to be reconstructed, 
But as an orthopedic surgeon or someone who's going to fix the ligaments, you not only have to be able aware that there's that the, they may have a vascular injury and, and a competent uh, vascular outflow to the limb, but if you're going to operate on this limb, you need to know that that exists so you don't do things like use the tourniquet or put the patient uh, in uh, positions and things that are going to be at risk for making the vascular injury worse, breaking off thrombus, other issues. This is a classic... Uh, catch the resident kind of a question. So we would talk to our residents and say, what's wrong with this x-ray? And immediately the residents will start saying, well, they've got a comminuted proximal fibular shaft fracture and it looks like there's a piece off here and there's some subluxation of the knee. The problem with this x-ray is that it exists. This x-ray tells me that this person was evaluated in the field, splinted and evacuated with a highly subluxed or possibly dislocated knee. This person was transported for I don't know how many hours with the knee subluxed or dislocated. This person was evaluated in an emergency setting and waited for x-rays with their knee subluxed or dislocated. The person then received x-rays and waited probably for an interpretation from a radiologist. The person finally had the knee reduced and then was uh, uh, waiting for films to confirm that the knee was reduced. All this time is passing while potentially this person is not getting a blood flow to their limb. And while you may not have to reconstruct these injuries with only six hours of ischemic time, you can easily imagine that if someone is airlifted from a place like Alaska, uh, with a long transit time and a dislocated limb. The clock is ticking on the extremity uh, during this. And this gets back to Nell's basically saying the number one thing we have to do is, is remember to reduce these limbs. And this in and of itself creates a problem. If you think about it, let's take a look at these three x-rays here. The one on the left, as I've just said, is a problem. We should never have this x-ray. In fact, unless the, the limb is irreducible, we should never see an x-ray that shows a complete dislocation. The second x-ray lets you know there's a problem. This is a stress view, whether it's accidental or on purpose. You can see there's gross widening of the lateral aspect of the joint here. This tells you there has to be ligament incompetency, okay? And this is maybe lucky. It's good to get an x-ray that looks like this because most people would look at this and say, hmm, there's something going on with this knee. I wonder if they've got an associated vascular injury. The big issue is the third x-ray which will make someone assume there's no problem. A radiologist can see this if they haven't talked to or examined the patient, really don't know much about the injury. They'll read this as basically being no fractures on the film, this is okay. But it's not okay because this may be the Willis McGehee. This may be somebody who's had a knee dislocation that's spontaneously reduced. They've got a multiple ligament injury. The person in the emergency room might see this film or hear the, the report from the radiology and say, well, there's not a problem, we'll stick them in a splint and we'll send them out. And that's where mistakes get made. What about the tibial plateau fractures? Well, like all injuries, and I've learned more about this from my uh, colleagues at Harborview, uh, fractures are not all the same. And any time you assess a film, you've got to think very carefully about what it is that the film is telling you. Every single film tells a story, whether the story is struggle, whether the story is, is what's happening. And the problem is that oftentimes when we get reports or see reports, or if you're not used to sort of thinking about films in that way, you get lulled into making a lot of mistakes. So on this film, you take a look at it, and this might get read as, well, if you look over here at the medial tibial plateau, there's a little avulsion fracture. And if you look carefully at the lateral, you'll say there's a non-displaced tibial plateau fracture. Well, technically that's true, but what this is doing is it's actually telling you a much more uh, interesting story. If, uh, if you look at a CT scan or a three-dimensional <laughs> CT scan for clarity, what you see here is that this limb, in this view and in this view, has a rotational instability. The femur is rotating forward, and you can imagine that the way that this small marginal fracture of the tibial plateau occurred is that at some point along the way, the PCL and probably the medial collateral ligament structures have to have been disrupted to allow the amount of translation that allowed this kind of compression fracture at the very edge of the tibial plateau. And this is something we call a marginal fracture. It's not, not your standard sort of tibial plateau fracture. And again, it's something that someone might look at. Someone might be seen in the emergency room and splinted and sent out and say, hey, this is not that big a deal. It is a big deal. The fracture itself is probably not a huge deal. It's eminently fixable. But what the fracture is telling you is that this limb at some point had to have been grossly subluxed or dislocated and that this is a risk for the person having an unrecognized vascular injury. So we call these marginal fractures, and it's a completely different animal from your standard tibial plateau fracture. It suggests that this person's had a severe hyperextension injury or their knee's been subluxed, and you have to assume that this knee at some point was dislocated, and you have to assume that they may have a vascular injury until you can prove otherwise. We can take a look carefully at these marginal fractures. Again, this is a different type of a marginal fracture. 
Uh, here again, we can look at the medial side of the knee. This all looks pretty healthy over here, but look what's going on here at the front of the knee. We've basically got this giant divot in the front of the knee that's created. Again, it's at the margin of the tibial plateau. And all of this is basically a giant chunk of the plateau that was forced off by the motion of the, the femur above. And this, again, uh, portends that this person has had at least enough subluxation that they'd had a vascular injury. In fact, this patient did have a vascular injury. It was appropriately evaluated and fixed emergently. But again, it's a sign that these marginal uh, fractures are, are definitely at risk for there being a, a vascular injury and that this is a sign that this is the case. Another type of tibial plateau fracture, again, these are all falling in the guise and your MR uh, or your radiology read uh, is going to be, well, this person's got a tibial plateau fracture. And again, same kind of thing. What do you see when you look at this film? Well, you say, geez, they've got some comminution of the proximal fibular shaft and there's this uh, tibial plateau fracture, which looks almost like it would be what we'd call a Schatzker uh, uh, two variant or a split depressed uh, uh, or split uh, fracture of the uh, lateral tibial plateau. Well. Actually, not so much the case. Again, if we take a careful look at this, we can look at the medial plateau. This looks pretty healthy over here. And I'm going to try and stop this if I can, right about here. If you actually look carefully at this, what you're seeing is what we call a dissociative uh, avulsion fracture. Okay, The biceps femoris and the lateral collateral ligament, which attach atop the uh, fibula, and the uh, iliotibial band and capsular structures, which attach to the fibula here, these are all still attached, most likely, to these bony uh, uh, fragments. And what's happened is that uh, during the translation or the energy of the injury, the, the biceps, the LCL, the capsule pulled, or literally avulsed these giant fragments and pulled this bone apart. And so while the tibia was going one direction, the rest of the patient, the femur, and the uh, structures uh, uh, who, that are attached to these proximal fragments are staying with the rest of the body. And, and this, again, is a sign that this person uh, is at risk or that there's been a significant enough displacement or dissociation of the uh, tibia and the femur to create a vascular injury. The last kind of plateau fracture we'll look at are, are the ones that are just uh, uh, an obvious bony deformity uh, that involves the ligament attachment sites. And here you can see uh, in these CT scan cuts, this is basically just gross comminution of the posterior plateau and the uh, uh, things, and what, what you can imagine here is that the uh, cruciate ligament insertion sites, particularly at the posterior joint, the lateral collateral structures, uh, which attach over here on the lateral side of the knee, all of these uh, ligaments are de facto torn because they're attached to bony fragments that are no longer attached to the tibia. So again, what you have to consider is when you're seeing this kind of comminution or this kind of displacement at the insertion sites of the ligaments, the ligaments. Uh, uh, by inference, are, are no longer in continuity. And again, this is at risk for a vascular injury. This person also did have a vascular injury. So the take-home message, I think, from all the talks uh, this morning, in some ways, it's, it's we're here preaching to the converted because we're all at a tertiary or quaternary care center where we see and, and know how to, to take care of these things. The problem is this is really the responsibility of everybody who sees and cares for athletes or people, anybody who gets an extremity injury. And this can in include on-field, our first responders, our coaches, our trainers, uh, even people on the field who see any kind of an injury like you see with Willis McGehee. You've got to be thinking and, and telling people that this is a more serious injury than they might think. Our emergency room, our first aid clinics, where sometimes these people are sent to in the first place, or even our clinic or office when you get a history that sounds like it's suggestive of a, a more significant injury. Again, we want to reduce these knees as soon as possible. We try not to see a film that's got gross displacement. We have to assume that there's a vascular injury with a multi-ligament injury regardless of the mechanism. Even if the x-rays appear normal, especially in cases where there's a common perineal nerve injury, uh, if there's gross or combined sagittal and coronal plane instability, and when there's a marginal variant tibial plateau fracture or dissociative pattern or severe comminution that involves the tibial eminences or attachment points of the central pivot. So again, I'd like to say uh, thanks to all the people who teach us these lessons and to all my colleagues that, uh, when things really work well. Um, but that's all I've got, and I think we're going to open the floor to any questions that people have now. Questions? Ben, yeah, yeah uh, this is an excellent uh, talk from all of you. Uh, one common question is if there is a uh, vascular compromised limb, like a lower leg, uh, can you somehow extend this magic six-hour time frame by icing the leg or cooling it down? We get a lot of these far distant referrals from Alaska, and again, there was the usual delay, as Dr. Wall pointed out, with x-rays.
So is there any way to kind of fudge the survival time of a limb? You know, it makes sense. It, it's, uh, we can put kidneys in refrigerators or in coolers and send them across the country and transplant them. Why can't we save skeletal muscle? Uh, no one's ever really looked at that. Um, you know, there are different models of hind limb ischemia and different periods of time, of, a time, of time that you can look at ischemia and then look at what attenuates that ischemic injury over time. Putting the leg in ice is, has been an idea. The problem is, is the contact of the, of the, uh, uh, the cold uh, ice with the skin usually causes more problems than, than not. Um, but it's an interesting, interesting concept. What I think is more appropriate is to have experienced surgeons in the field who could potentially shunt an injury like we do on the battlefield where you're far removed from, uh, from definitive care and get that patient uh, to definitive care in a more rapid or expeditious fashion. Thank you, uh, Nels, Chris, and Ben. One of the things that you showed the case is uh, the patient with the limb that developed the intimal tear, had the intimal tear, and then uh, clotted that limb. What role do you think the tourniquet played in that clot? And I'll um, ask that to both Chris and Ben, because in my mind, I'm not sure that there's a role for tourniquets in uh, trauma. And I question that, because if you look at what orthopedic trauma surgeons do, they operate about the shoulder, spine, neck, back, pelvis, and upper thigh, always without tourniquets. But when they get to the lower leg, uh, below the knee, or for example in the arm, they often use tourniquets. And historically, tourniquets weren't used, um, for example, in Europe for trauma, they still aren't used that much. But as orthopedic surgeons do trauma in this country, they tend to use tourniquets, and I'm not sure that in the setting of trauma, with already the microvascular, micro ultrastructural damage, that tourniquets are beneficial. I know that, Chris, you said that uh, tourniquet probably shouldn't have been used in one of those other cases, and it's to be avoided, but what are your thoughts in the role of tourniquets in trauma, especially in these type of injuries? I, th I think that's a great question, and I was actually going to challenge Nels earlier, because I don't think that this was a delay. I think you're beating yourself up too much. I don't think that this case that you presented initially was a delay in diagnosis. The orthopedic surgeon documented palpable pedal pulses prior to doing the definitive uh, knee surgery a day later. But when the patient's tourniquet was taken down, he recognized that the patient had a cold ischemic foot and called for a vascular consult. That revascular revascularization was done in an expeditious fashion, and I would submit that this was a failed vascular reconstruction that led to her eventual amputation, uh, not necessarily a delay in, di in diagnosis. Now, as, when it comes to tourniquets, in vascular injury, it's true, unless you heparinize the patient, if they have an intimal injury, they're going to have a thrombotic complication from the, the ischemia that's caused by the tourniquet. So I, I think that's a great um, uh, lesson for all of us, is that probably we should avoid tourniquets in, in trauma patients. I, what do you think, Chris? It's interesting. I'd, I'd be lying if I said that I don't ever use tourniquets in these. And in fact, uh, we're probably going to take a look carefully at the uh, last number of these that we've done. Um, as part of the protocol, if you uh, uh, look at the protocol that we've been trying to use, in patients who uh, we evaluate, in those who have a vascular injury, I don't use tourniquet at all. So if I've documented that there's any kind of an intimal injury or flow disturbance and things like that, I won't use tourniquet. When it comes down to uh, doing definitive fixations in people who didn't have a vascular injury, if we check a Doppler and they look okay, I actually do, on, on not rare occasions, use a tourniquet for certain parts of the procedure. And the reason behind that uh, for me is that I'm, I'm oftentimes thinking about the amount of time that it's going to take to do the dissection anatomically on, say, the lateral medial knee. That isn't so much of a problem doing the open parts of the procedure uh, without a tourniquet. Usually you can take a little time and things like that. But restoring the central pivot, which we often do arthroscopically, can be a little more difficult to do in the setting of uh, uh, an, a very uh, uh, bloody field and, and having difficulty seeing. And there you start to run into secondary problems of uh, you know, uh, having to use a, a pump or uh, introducing fluid into the knee under pressure to try and control the visual field. And so oftentimes the way that, uh, that we've been doing this is 
I'll uh, do the medial and lateral dissections of the knee, isolate the, uh, uh, the structures that I need to be repaired and tag them and get them ready for repair, put up the tourniquet, restore the central pivot as fast as I can, and we can do the ACL and PCL in fairly short order, uh, and then let the tourniquet down and, and continue doing the repairs on the medial and lateral side of the knee. So I absolutely um, understand and buy the concept that in an injured extremity, about the worst thing you can do is cut off the blood supply to the extremity. But uh, the reality of the situation is that I think the job can be a lot harder and maybe have some other complications by not using a tourniquet in certain parts of the case. Now, having said that, um, I, I do think the tourniquet had a lot to do with, for instance, the first case uh, and, and the development of the, the, the need for a vascular reconstruction. And, um, and I'm not sure, you know, so far we haven't had problems using the tourniquet and I think we're probably will end up publishing a fairly large series. I'm somewhat conflicted about doing that because again, like the Miranda protocol, you know, Miranda writes a, a paper that says, you know, hard signs pretty much tell us with 100%, you know, positive predictive value that there's going to be a vascular injury. And what people hear when they read that study is, ah, you know, there's a pedal pulse, we're okay. When in fact that's not the case. They don't remember that there were these, you know, things like the observation for 24 hours and all this other stuff. And my fear about publishing a paper that says we use tourniquets a lot when we're doing this is that orthopedic surgeons will look at that and say, hey, we use a tourniquet every time we get one of these because it's more efficient and it's easy. Mm -hmm. And so that's the problem with trying to write that paper, is that in reality we do do that, but uh, it, they, we do it carefully, right? Well, let me just follow up on that. I know we've just discussed the arterial side of inflow and the effect of tourniquets if there's an intimal injury, but there's also the venous side, and in trauma you're going to have microthrombosis, a lot of soft tissue injury, and so there might also be another role to avoid tourniquets in trauma just in terms of venous outflow. Ben, you mentioned uh, prone positioning sometimes, and that's something yeah. new to me. Can you uh, quickly discuss with Chris the thought process of prone versus supine, uh, when, where, what, uh, both of you in terms of how do you arrange that, how do you discuss that? So uh, we've had a couple of unique patterns of injury at Harborview where uh, we get posterior knee dislocations and a transverse laceration above the popliteal fossa. And that, the, the, the case that comes immediately to mind is a, is a, a, log, a, truck, a uh, logging trucker who was standing on the side of his truck and a log came off the edge as they were loading it onto the truck and came right down his leg and caused a, a posterior knee dislocation and a high laceration. The problem with him was we started supine, uh, harvested vein, uh, got uh, proximal control of his uh, common femoral artery, and then tried to approach him from a medial approach. And he, his popliteal artery and vein had transected and were way up in his thigh. And trying to get that from a, a medial approach was incredibly difficult. We stopped. We flipped him over prone, re-prepped, re-draped, and everything was right there in our faces, and it made it a very quick operation and a very safe operation. So sometimes it's easier for us to expose from a posterior approach than from a medial approach uh, where we're you know, trying to dig up under, uh, under the leg in a big thigh. So I don't know. It, it, you, you, you can't do anything to fix the, the knee injury at that time any, anyway. All you can do is skeletal exactly fixation. So, so my job is easy because I can't work on the knee for at least a couple of weeks after these injuries. And our Harborview, uh, you know, orthopedic surgeons, they could put an X-fix on with the patient on their head. I don't think it'd matter if they were front, back, or wherever. And so uh, the other thing about these injuries is they're often, once they're reduced, relatively stable. So oftentimes, uh, unless you're really concerned that the amount of displacement that the patient's going to have in the knee after they've been reduced and had a vascular reconstruction is going to upset the vascular repair, you can either just splint them in extension for a few days, in which case after that they're almost always somewhat rigidly fixed and hard to move, uh, or uh, if necessary, if they are really still grossly unstable, put on an external fixator as a temporizing measure until you can do the definitive fixation, which has to wait anyway. So prone is okay. Okay. Well, thank you all. <laughs>